Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back after your short break. I hope you had some good conversations and that you brought your little device, which is now some sort of a personal friend of you, with you outside. I'm already telling you now that please, at the end of this session, we're going to be using it this session again, but at the end of this session, when you leave this room, then please hand it in at the exit, because there's no other place in the world where you can use this thing other than here at this conference. So. Uh, um, please hand it in at the end of the session. But we're not that far. Um, we're now continuing with our program, with our next step. And as said before, we now have our second keynote speaker. We then have another panel discussion with interaction. And then at 5 o'clock, we will have the award ceremony uh, that will start then. But let's first move to our first keynote speaker after uh, the break, or the keynote speaker after the break, um, Mariana. Mazzucato. She is the Professor in Economics of Innovations at the Science Policy Research Unit, uh, Unit of the University of Sussex. She'll be speaking to us for 20 minutes and the title of her speech is The Rate and Direction of Economic Growth, Challenges for Space. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to our keynote speaker, Mrs. Mazzucato. Thanks. Can I have the clicker? Clicker is... Okay. Thank you. There you go. Okay, well, I cannot see you at all. I assume you're there. Um, I have less time than I thought, so I'm going to speed through some slides. Don't get dizzy. This is going to sort of test whether you're awake or falling asleep. Those that are awake should start feeling sick when I start going through them too quickly. My aim is to debunk all sorts of uh, assumptions you have about a question that I saw you were asked in the middle of the day when I was at a different conference giving a talk, but I wanted to know what was happening here, so I went live. Um, and I saw that you were asked to uh, vote on which institution is going to be leading commercialization of space research, and a good half of you came up with the wrong answer. <laughs> anyway, I'm kidding. There's no wrong answer. I want to say, I want to suggest that it's the wrong answer to the wrong question, and actually to get much more interesting questions through, uh, if you want a provocation, which is to uh, also ask what can we learn from other big technological revolutions, whether we think of the big changes that occurred around the IT revolution, the nanotech revolution, the biotech revolution, the emerging green tech revolution, for what could become a space 4.0 revolution. And the context, of course, is one that you know well, which is the way that we used to think about, if you want, the commercialization of space. Sorry, can you put the timer on so I know how much time I actually have? That would help? Yeah, it's not moving? <laughs> I'm very good at setting, sticking to time when I know what the time is, um, was often framed in a very static way. So in terms of seeing if you want space as a sector, and if you just look at the words here, it sounds you know, very kind of bureaucratic. So we need to improve the worldwide competitiveness of the European industry by maintaining and developing space technology, by encouraging the rationalization and development of an industrial structure appropriate to market requirements, blah, blah, blah. This is the way that commercialization used to be talked about. And luckily, we've moved on. Note, the timer is still not moving, so I will talk for an hour and miss my taxi. Um, and so now, of course, the conversation is changing, not just in space, but in many different sectors, where the whole issue of, if you want commercialization, is much more a question, if you want, of ecosystems, of different types of public and private actors, different types of structures within even those uh, public and private actors, but also with the global if you want perspective, and especially thinking about the big grand challenges that different sectors together can be tackling versus, say, just coming up with an industrial policy that says we want to be good at space research, you know, automotive, financial services, creative industry, et cetera. Um, and this is really a huge opportunity. It's a great opportunity, I think, to really rethink what we mean by innovation policy in an era post-crisis where, um, you know, post-financial crisis, where there's all this talk about rebalancing from short-term speculative growth towards the real economy, and instead of turning that into a static call, again, for sectoral approaches, really framing it in ter terms of these grand challenges is a very exciting uh, uh, thing. Anyway, so the big question, however, is that this is, of course, also occurring in an era of we can call it austerity, which is sort of a, a catch-all word, but of course of huge pressures for all sorts of organizations, whether it's ESA, NASA, DARPA, the BBC in this country, to actually show their economic value. 
Uh, this has always been, this has always been, if you want something that different organizations had to prove, but I would argue that this is really the era of what in Holland they call valorization. The, those Dutch people here will know that word, and I think that's kind of a dysfunctional uh, transformation of the word value, which actually means something much greater than just showing if you want economic value in terms of jobs and patents and startups. Um, but I would argue that the biggest challenge we're actually facing in this really exciting time of the kind of space 4.0 interpretations of the challenges that industries have ahead, which again is about how to think about new types of public-private partnerships and new partnerships between sectors to face grand challenges to actually answer this question, which is the question that you were asked if you want, probably throughout the day, and I just happened to tune in for that survey, which is, well, what's the role of the state in different national states, but also cross-national, uh, cross transnational public structures like ESA in this process? Is it just to de-risk the private actors that we're trying to involve in this great Space 4.0 challenge? Is it just to level the playing field? I'm sure these are words you've heard, so that the, the, the real revolutionaries like Elon Musk and others can do their great thing. Is it to, economics talk, fix different problems, market failures? Can you then, yeah? I'll what? tell you when you're in 10 minutes. Right? Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, or is it something more interesting? And I really want to argue that it's something more interesting. And if, and, and if we don't find the vocabulary and a very different dialogue to talk about this thing that's something more interesting, we're in big trouble. And Space 4.0 will just become just as boring as that first slide I had there where I said there was a kind of a static approach to commercialization. And this is, again, the, the provocation, which I just happened to tune in when, when you were given this survey. So I want, you know, maybe we should do this survey again at the end of my talk, if that's possible. I don't know if the technology will allow that. Um, Anyway, and again, we are fed this kind of dichotomy constantly. I don't have much time to, go, to read you know, all the slides, but this kind of notion that the revolutionaries are in the business sector and all that the public institutions, again, not just national ones, but transnational ones, need to sort of set the conditions, fund the basics, the, which might be the public good problem, so basic research, and then allow all the downstream stuff to occur in business, is, is, is constantly fed to us, even with these very specific words like revolutionaries in business versus kind of boring bureaucrats in, um, in the public sector. I'm not gonna go over the whole fixing failures approach, I'll just say that what I try to do, and sorry for this completely self-promotional slide, um, what I try to do in the entrepreneurial state, which I always like to see Das Kapital come up there because I don't think I'll ever write a book that is translated into German as Das Kapital again, but the capital of the state, what I tried to do in this book was absolutely to debunk that dichotomy of the kind of boring but needed fix the basic problems public sector versus revolutionary Elon Musk's. And I tried to do that specifically by actually looking, as I said before, at the history of different types of space 4.0 moments, but in different sectors. And when they kind of really rose up to big mission-oriented and challenge-driven kind of approaches. And um, I want to do so by just asking these kind of four questions. Again, quite quickly, but it's nice to have them all up there at the same time. What do we actually know about directionality, right? So both innovation and growth don't just have a rate, they have a direction. How were these directions set in the past? Um, what role did both public and private sector institutions in the forms of their partnerships possibly co-direct or maybe was one in a bit of a more leadership position, which then enabled all this bottom-up experimentation, et cetera? Two, what do we know about the actual organizations involved, how they were able to become dynamic and welcome the risk-taking and the failures, which are inevitable? For every internet, you have many concords. For every Tesla, which received a massive uh, 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 guaranteed loan from government, there's many cylindras. Um, what do we know about that whole kind of risk reward and uh, welcoming of exploration, experimentation in organizations, whether it's NASA, ESA, BBC, DARPA. In other words, those very important public organizations that have very much been lead players in some of these transformations. Three, if we actually start saying, you know, this is not about just fixing market failures, but actively shaping and creating markets, through different types of really dynamic, challenge-led, mission-oriented policies, what does that imply for how we then actually evaluate the policies? Because we know that public organizations are constantly evaluated, hence the valorization uh, uh, challenge. Could we, for example, think of much you know, more dynamic measures which actually capture that transformational, challenge-led role? Because if not, guess, guess what happens? You immediately get accused of crowding out the private sector, you know, step back. 
and I welcome you all to look at the BBC Charter Review on what happens when an organization as mission-oriented as the BBC then doesn't have the right metrics to actually capture what it has been doing, which has actually been quite phenomenal over the last um, uh, decades. And lastly, you know, the point is obviously not just to lead for, to innovation for innovation's sake. Of course, there's, again, the challenges, which are about directing innovation in particular ways, but the profits, and there are profits, there's big profits, which ensue, you know, what does this mean if we have a market shaping, market creating agenda where we're sharing risks together between different types of organizations, public, private, third sector, in terms of also sharing the rewards? And this is really important. In fact, it's fine for me to spend so much time on this because in some ways I could just do this slide and stop because this is you know, the whole point. This is really important because vocabulary matters. If we just talk about de-risking, as I mentioned before, it's not obvious why an organization that is simply de-risking should share in the rewards. When you say, actually, we're taking a hell of a lot of risks in pursuing particular directions where we're going to have quite a bit of failures along the way, then of course you should share in the rewards. So words matter. Yeah. Um, so again, I'm going to go through this quickly. The first thing is, you know, we know that actually there are different types of brokers right now in the space economy, this emerging uh, uh, public-private ecosystem in space. Um, but what do we actually know about the exact kind of relationships in terms of, for example, in the, in the US there's CASIS, which is very much brokering the relationship between NASA and different types of private actors like NanoRacks, like SpaceX, like Planet Labs. Do, are we sure we understand how the form of these relationships, literally the contracts, the bargaining contracts, right? Don't forget that everything is a contract. We have this ridiculous word, IPR, intellectual property rights. It's not a right, it's a contract. It has to be negotiated. What do we know about how this emerging number of public and private actors and the forms that these uh, relationships are taking are or are not affecting the direction? And what's interesting is, again, if we look back at some big transformational changes, you know, there was, there was uh, very much in some ways a directive from different types of public organizations which went beyond, again, fixing uh, these market failures. But what we know is that there was a decentralized presence across the whole innovation chain, lots of bottom-up experimentation through the private sector, but the direction you know, was, was pretty confidently set through pretty big missions, whether it was the mission to go to the moon, whether it was the mission today, if you think of the big transformation happening in Germany, the energy vent mission, very much, you could almost call it top down, but they have very much worked when they then enabled different types of relationships and bottom up, if you want, experimentation, but not giving up the direction to, say, a broker who decides just by, um, opening up that process to simply allow those relationships to actually form that direction. The innovation chain, which is in the end what we're talking about when we're talking about space, there's all sorts of investments that are needed, whether it's downstream or upstream. The innovation chain, as we know, is very nonlinear, but also that the presence of different types of public actors in these previous revolutions was actually across the whole chain. It wasn't, you know, just fix the public good problem, do your great research, and then let the downstream actors, the private sector, be really kind of cool and do their thing. For example, the patient long-term finance uh, for the few firms, because there's few, few firms that actually wanted to engage with some of these missions often came from public institutions. In the US, for example, from the Small Business Innovation Research Program, in uh, Israel through the Yasma Public Venture Capital Fund. But again, if you actually look at the breadth and depth of that public activity, it's very hard, again, to justify simply in terms of market failures. I often use the iPhone as an example, which is if you look at all the technology in the phone that makes it a smartphone and not a stupid phone, came from different types of public um, uh, actors, which if you then look at their sort of mission statements, they weren't from the beginning thinking about all these technologies that were gonna sort of come out. They were again spillovers from this more challenge-led, mission-oriented type of, uh, uh, of research. And in fact, one of the big risks we have today is that as commercialization itself almost becomes the mission, because we obsess on valorization, this, in, in some ways, I don't want to say natural, because nothing's natural, but this incredibly dynamic, uh, uh, move, uh, how do you say, uh, uh, this dynamic of these uh, technologies that did become commercial and create all sorts of profits in the private sector, but that were outputs of um, missions that were actually thinking about something grander, that, in fact, potentially is put at risk. And I would argue, actually, it is being put at risk today. 
Um, we should also never forget the demand side. We know, for example, that one of the big advantages in space that the U.S. has always had has been through procurement policy, you know, a national defense industry which has absolutely procured all sorts of technologies, hence created a market for the private sector, which we don't have in Europe, um, or as much so in Europe. But we should also not forget there's also other types of demand factors, which sometimes, especially in an era of, again, I don't really like the word austerity because it's too easy, but, you know, of telling the, private se the public sector to, to step back, we also don't get some pretty bold type demand side policies that we also had in the past. Just to give you an example that Carlota Perez often gives, she says that, for example, mass production, which is a huge revolution, really changed production and distribution across the world, would not have had the effect it did across the whole economy had there not been bold demand side policies, including things like suburbanization. People didn't just wake up and go to the suburbs. Just to say, again, without going into details of that example, you know, this strong presence on both the supply side and the demand side and across that whole innovation chain of public actors which were very much uh, uh, mission oriented, which is what I'm getting to now in terms of what do we know about the organizations, is something that really goes beyond, again, this question of will it be public or will it be private that leads the way. And again, this whole point about missions is actually creating excitement as well. If you look at the kind of people that have worked, uh, and sorry if I focus so much on the US, but it's just because the US continues to be sold to us. Silicon Valley continues to be sold to us as a kind of Elon Musk, Steve Jobs thing, when actually huge amounts of public investment, which I'm trying to outline here. Um, what's really interesting when you actually look at the organizations is how these kind of mission statements which kind of explicitly go against what economists always say in terms of, oh, just fix that little problem there, uh, also helped attract really high-level people. Um, Steve Chu, recently, Nobel Prize winner in physics, directing the Department of Energy. Why? Because it's an honor to go work in a department which has been given the mission, literally, from Obama to direct the 800 billion stimulus program. Would he have accepted that job and left ac academia? If they said, hey, come here, you've got to help us help you know, commercialization and energy, and we need to fix that problem and you know, think of some carbon tax, taxes and, and you know, facilitate the private involvement and nudge them and fix different types of market failures. No, he would have preferred to stay in academia. What he said was, we need to absolutely direct the stimulus so it provides a real transformation of the U.S. economy. Now, what happened later, we know there was all sorts of uh, problems in Congress, but the point is, mission-oriented organizations have historically also had a greater success in terms of bringing into the civil, the, um, civil sector some pretty high-minded people. Um, I'm going to skip through these. Um, and so this is one of the issues, which is also thinking in terms of the missions, whether it's you know the old ones of the moon, the new ones to Mars, or thinking about these grand challenges in terms of how to use space technologies to address big problems in health, in energy, even immigration, really requires uh, thinking if you want, uh, both in terms of how to attract talent in these organizations, but also how to uh, distribute, if you want, this directive um, aspect so that it's not just, you know, let's commercialize so we bring the private sector into low Earth orbit and then forget that actually the relationships we set up there can actually affect the mission itself. Um, and this whole issue of active versus passive is kind of like a false dilemma, horizontal versus vertical. Uh, absolutely, many of these transformational changes required both, but in some ways, you know, also being very much steered through these uh, big uh, problems. Assessment, all I want to say here, again, skipping over some of these, is, you know, this point which Bill Gates often reminds us, which is government has to lead, we will follow, because we go where there's big opportunities, and historically the opportunities have absolutely been financed from public institutions, also then requires being able to capture this, this creation of something new. So just think of health, instead of just thinking about drugs, if we transform the health and the life sciences area to include things like lifestyle, we better be able to measure that change as opposed to pretend that there's an existing market and you're just sort of taking a piece of the pie, which then maybe is too big, too small, you're crowding out, you're crowding in. We don't actually have dynamic measures through which to capture that transformation. And so if we actually have societal development goals, which which are about really you know, capturing uh, new forms of partnerships to address these grand challenges, we better be able to even 
uh, not just look at things like the startups, the new company formation, the new patents, but actually capture this process of bottom-up experimentation um, and of transformation of a market to actually be something new. And again, when I mentioned the BBC, if you look at what the BBC has done, and it's, it's very useful because they're being really scrutinized right now, they were willing even to go into things like soap operas and talk shows, which is very different from the public good problem, which is make boring documentaries about giraffes, which the private sector might not make. But through that, they actually transmitted something that I would call social value or public value, using sort of old uh, um, uh, outlets, but transforming the messages, if you want, that were coming out of these outlets, and yet the fact that they were seen as occupying you know, a chunk of the market that was supposed to be for business led to this crowding out criteria because we actually don't have these measures of social value. Lastly, risks and rewards. Why is it important? Well, because the objective, of course, as I said, is not just smart growth around you know, big technological and societal challenges, but also inclusive growth and sharing the rewards that come out from this massive co-investment that has to occur. And again, this is, I don't have time to look at this graph, this is looking at the different types of actors which I mentioned in the beginning that are appearing, uh, focusing mainly on the US landscape in the emerging public-private ecosystem and space. This, this you know, just, just welcoming of private activity into space without actually thinking of the factors that I mentioned before potentially creates some problems. So even cases told us when we did, um, uh, Doug Robinson and I did a study, they said, well, yeah, we really wanted the private sector to come and work, for example, inter in the International Space Station with low Earth orbit, and they were like, ah, eh, we're not really interested, so we got them interested in some areas around, for example, biotech and pharma. They were then interested, but they said, of course, we have to patent, right? We will only play with you if, you, if we can patent. And initially, NASA was like, no, no, you can't. This is, you know, publicly funded uh, astronauts up there, publicly funded infrastructure, but slowly, this, if you want, uh, uh, skewed distribution, I would argue, of power, uh, facilitated, if you want, which is happening today, which is we are actually allowing IPR, almost as if it was a condition for the private sector to be involved because of this, if you want, balance of power problem. Um, there's, of course, we know that many of the uh, uh, publicly funded areas, for example, with Copernicus and the space images, sorry, the images of Earth from space are, are being given to, for example, different public, private actors for free. Maybe that's good, maybe that's not good. What should the question be? The question should be, what is that actually doing to this ecosystem of public and private actors, and how can we actually make sure that through particular types of arrangements, of which there are a varied type of arrangements, that we actually build what I would call a mutualistic and a symbiotic ecosystem, and not what potentially is a parasitic ecosystem and you know from biology there's all sorts of things we can learn about these different types of ecosystems and why is that important well because fine let's get different private actors to engage in space but let's do it under particular types of conditions that will refuel these public budgets for the future which then can fund the future missions and by the way this used to not be a problem NASA was founded in a year that the top marginal taxation rate with the richest paid in tax was 91% under a Republican uh, military general, President Eisenhower. We know that's no longer the era we live in. We don't have to be folkloric and want to go back to that, but we should really rethink what are the underlying assumptions in terms of the spillovers uh, that, that we have been riding on, including, by the way, IPR, as I mentioned. Patents are increasingly going upstream. The tools for research are being patented. Um, and that's a problem. So it's not about good patents, bad patents. It's about what form of patents do we actually need to produce what I would call uh, productive entrepreneurship and not unproductive entrepreneurship. And I'm done. I just want to say, Elon, be part of the new conversation as opposed to the old one. Government is more than just the money it collects from tax. The most successful governments, which have had different types of organizations, Yasmin, Israel, NASA, ESA, have been those that have actually formed strategic mission-oriented organizations. It's a hard thing to do, but it requires thinking through these very hard issues and to get rid of these static conversations that make it a false dichotomy, like the one that you were asked to vote on some hours ago. <laughs> Thank you very much, I'm done. Professor Mazzucato. Um, now.
I know you now have to sprint because you have to catch a train, but thank you very much for telling us that the vote we had earlier was a wrong result to a wrong question. It's we're not, a wrong question. We're not going to have a second vote on okay. it, uh, because then maybe if you don't like that result, then you'll stay longer and miss your train to okay. have another uh, Wrong question, talk. wrong question. Answer but, is irrelevant. Uh, but thank you very much for your, for your speech and telling us the importance of the role of government in, um, in innovation with lots of examples in it.